Well, I guess it's been a couple of years since I've been here. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, hopefully, I'll um, uh, share some things that are important to all of you. I thought I, I would start with just the economic outlook uh, and then get into uh, maybe the market outlook if you're of interest <laughs> to you. Um, being at Morgan Stanley, obviously we have some uh, compliance issues. These slides were done about a month and a half ago, and uh, as much as I wanted to change them the last couple of days, it couldn't be done, but I still, uh, I think you'll find that some of these slides are pretty relevant. A lot's happened in, uh, in my life the last couple of years. Uh, I'm a grandfather now, which I didn't realize what that entailed. Um, I, I say that because I didn't realize when, when uh, my daughter lives in Ponte Vedra, so now we're going to be living in Ponte Vedra. <laughs> as my wife said, we're moving. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> From Annapolis, as great as that place is. So uh, I'll be a Floridian by October. So anyway. <laughs> All right, let's let's uh, let's have some fun. Let's, uh, let's uh, as uh, Mike said, uh, I've been a top-down global strategist for um, over 30 years, which is interesting because most of the people I see on TV now, they look like they haven't even been in a bear market. They're, they're in their late 20s. They might have learned about it, but I'm not so sure uh, they've lived it, and there's a big difference, isn't there, for those of us that have been through a few of them. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I left uh, Invesco a couple of years ago because, uh, quite frankly, they wouldn't build a model that I talked about the last couple of times I was here. It's a way to invest that's beat the S&P 83% of the time, and um, I figured out I'd just do it myself. So um, here's what's going on. Uh, is the economy growing or slowing, in your opinion? Growing? growing. Yeah. So GDP, if you recall, uh, second quarter, 3.1%. Third quarter, 3.2. What was fourth quarter? 2.6. Time is slower. <coughs> At least by that number. There's a new way to measure GDP growth that's a little bit more accurate. The problem with GDP is it looks at inventories, it looks at exports, net exports, and so you had the hurricane in the third quarter, so that closed some of the ports. You couldn't bring things off the ships. That impacted uh, imports. That inflated the export number, which inflated the GDP number. Fourth quarter, same situation, but in the reverse. The new measure is called final sales to domestic purchasers. Big word, all it means is GDP, take out the exports, take out inventories, what did the economy do? You can see, second quarter, 2.7, third quarter, 1.9, the economy was slowing. Fourth quarter, 4.3, you're right. This economy is reaccelerating. And all the tax package did was front load that growth and accelerate it even more. So if you're wondering, well, is the economy going to grow? Yeah, it's going to grow. Unless we just get hit by a rock <clears throat> and the, the market pullback, that's not a rock. We've got four drivers to the economic growth. Remember, we talked about it last time. Government spending, corporate spending, consumer spending, overseas demand. Government spending more money, as you know, because of the tax package, about a billion, uh, five, uh, a trillion five. You've got corporations that have been really behind the curve. We keep thinking, oh boy, thank goodness they're going to bring back a couple billion dollars from overseas. They have $2.4 billion on their pocketbooks in the bank right now in cash and cash equivalents. They've been holding on to it for a long time. They really haven't been investing in plant and equipment. That makes sense. The capital utilization rate is still below average. What they are uh, investing in is robotics artificial uh, intelligence, things that increase productivity. But no, they've kept their workers and they're working their workers harder for less until recently. And you just heard the big wage number that, that rattled the market, which I'm kind of surprised at because they're kind of one-off events. It's a one-time, here's a bonus. Right? Walmart said, oh, we're going to give everybody this, oh, and then we're going to close 60 Sam Club stores. <laughs> what was that about? I mean, there's, there's a trade-off, because they're still operating at a profit. But yes, you're getting the, you're getting the, so you have state minimum wages were raised in what, 23 states, so that just hit. Bonuses just hit, and then some of these one-off events. So it inflated this number. You're not likely to see that continue, in my opinion. It'll get something a little more than, in fact, if I look at wages and salaries, X benefits, it increased year over year 2.2%, 2 
which is where it's been for the last four or five years. So that tells me maybe this is a reaction in the market. Maybe it's either something else or they're, they're focusing on the wrong thing like they did a couple years ago when the markets fell the first quarter of 2016 because of something going on in China, which is interesting because we only export 13% in our business in China. Net net is about 0.6% of GDP. And yet the markets were all flustered. We just come up with reasons to, 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 to say, oh yeah, this is why the market went. Yeah, we had more sellers than buyers. That's what happened. <laughs> And you have these computer models now that do it for us automatically. Algorithms. If this happens, I sell. If this happens, I sell. It's automatic. It's done behind the scenes. And now you've got another half a dozen companies that have the same models that feed off of each other, and then it accelerates. And this isn't going away. It just means that you're going to get bigger swings in the market, which has got to drive traders crazy. But if you're an investor, all it does is create anxiety. And we'll get into that in a second. So what do we have to get right if we want to figure out where the economy is going? Well, the consumer, right? Four ways for consumers to spend. Spend what you make, spend what you, no, three ways. Um, spend what you make, spend what you have in the bank, you borrow. Wages just went up in some areas. That's not a bad thing then, right? That, that allows the consumers to spend more money, which for me was important because the fourth quarter of last year that came in at 2.6%, if consumers kept the same savings rate, we would have grown at one and a half. Credit card debt is at an all-time high again. In fact, if we looked at the cycles, the economy borrowed $14 trillion after the tech wreck from 2003 to 2007 to help drive the economy. We got about $4.3 trillion in economic growth. And how much did we borrow this time around? $14.7 trillion. We've actually borrowed more money in this cycle than we had last cycle. We actually have more debt now than we did before. So maybe what the market's concerned about is the rise in rates and what that does to people who have <clears throat> over-indebtedness. But right now, the consumer looks pretty good. With wages up, uh, yes, they did spend a lot, but with low interest rates, they, they're able to handle that still. Um, not much pent-up demand, though. So I know some people in the auto business here, they already know what, what I'm already seeing. It's rolling over a little bit. A lot of it was this replace and repair from the hurricanes. So that gave a, a nice bump in business for a lot of us. And again, that's what skewed a lot of the numbers that we're seeing right now. But that, in, that effect will start to wane as time goes on. But we're getting more overseas demand because the weak dollar, I don't expect all of you to follow currencies, but when the dollar weakens, it makes our, our products cheaper overseas. And the dollar weakened about 8% last year, and it's still weakening this year. So it makes it harder for foreign, and, uh, um, invest, uh, foreign manufacturers to sell in our market, because their products are more expensive. It makes it easier for us to sell. And so our multinationals are gaining a, a great pricing advantage that allows them to sell more goods. And right now, for a lot of companies, well, for the market as a whole, about 40% of revenues come from overseas. So it's not just the U.S. market, obviously, it's a global market. So yeah, I see government spending more money, I see corporations spending more money, I see consumers spending more money, and definitely we're going to see more overseas demand. This is the strongest global growth in, uh, since 2011. Every major country in the world is growing positively right now and expanding. And we haven't seen that kind of synchronous growth in a long time. And it's accelerating. The IMF has increased their GDP, global GDP, three times since November. Now it's at 3.9%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it generates a lot of demand for U.S. goods and services. So what does that mean for this area? Weak dollar, I just, I, I just witnessed it last night. Sat at a table with a couple that just came in from Switzerland. Why wouldn't, you're gonna see more foreign tourism coming from Canada, from Europe, because it's cheaper. And it's still a place to go for a lot of, for a lot of people. So you have tourism, how, and then you have housing. What we're seeing, and this is interesting, where it, it used to be, well, kids just aren't buying houses anymore, they're renting. No, they're living at home. <laughs> and then they rent until when? Until they get married. 
<laughs> but as they get married, I, I, I went right through it. My daughter met the man of her life. She was in her 30s. So what happened on their honeymoon? She got pregnant. Well, let's start a family right away. So they're not waiting three or four or five years. So once, yeah, once you have a family, it's let's get a house. And we're seeing that 25 to 34 year old wages rise. So they're feeling more comfortable about their jobs, making more money, getting married, ha starting a family. Right now the demand for homes is about a million five and they're building about half that. So single family homes to me is one of the best places to go. If I was, wanted to go in the real estate business, it wouldn't be commercial. It, it would be, it'd be single family homes or warehouses <clears throat> to store business. Why are consumers spending so much money? I couldn't figure it out. I was like, what are they buying? Because car sales were rolling over. And then I was driving up my driveway, and I noticed I had a present on my porch. Like, ooh, what was that? Is that the Sichuan peppercorns that I bought, or the tube of socks that I? <laughs> Amazon has turned, I don't have to take money out of my pocket. I don't even have to take my wallet out. I just go. And a couple days later, I get a present. And who doesn't like a present? They do everything but put a bow on it, <laughs> right? Oh, I'll, I'll look at the statement at the end of the month later on. Ooh, spent a little much last month. Ooh, I want that. That's on sale. I mean, it's, that's what we're buying. That's where we're spending our money. And they need warehouses to ship, right? I've thought for a long time, a, a mall is just a display case in a warehouse. That's what it is. We go there to go, oh, that looks nice. Okay, let me go back and get on the internet and see where I can buy the cheapest price, right? <laughs> and then they ship it from Nordstrom's store. They ship it to you or whatever store you. That's kind of how it's changed, isn't it? And then, unless you're a teenager, then it's a place to socialize. So the economy actually is growing. It is expanding. Interest rates, <laughs> you can see this. Yeah, interest rates are going up because the Fed is behind the curve. What does that mean? We've got an economy that's growing a lot faster than monetary policy is, is, is just too loose, too accommodative. Their Fed funds rate needs to rise at least another 100 basis points. All they're doing, they gave us all this free money. And, we, and I talked about it a couple years ago, right? Liquidity trumps fundamentals. It rewards risk-taking and momentum investing. And left unchecked, it builds a bubble. And bubbles don't end very well. And this isn't the end, what you're going through right now, in my opinion. This is just a hiccup. Again, we'll talk about it in a sec. But yes, interest rates, uh, I think there's a limit to where rates go, only because of the supply and demand. Here's what's working against rates. Bond issuance this year from the government, sovereign debt, G4 countries, bond issuance will double this year. So we got double the supply, and all of a sudden the foreign investor is, in, is enthralled with investing their money in the U.S., mainly because of the weak dollar. So they buy a bond at 2.5%, the dollar falls 8, they lose 6. They have to hedge that. Hedging costs at least 2%. So here's what they do. They just do the math. What's our yield in our country? Real yield. That's the yield minus inflation. What's our real yield? What's U.S. real yield? Plus 2% for the hedge. Sometimes it goes to 3 to 4. And if our yield is less than that, they don't buy the paper. And if, they, and if it is, they do. And lately, the spread has not been in our favor. It is now. What did interest rates do last night? Fell. Because there's a global savings glut. There's an aging demographic in this country and many countries around the world that are yield starved. So yes, our yields will go up and then the world will come in and just bid them right back down, in my opinion. So I'm not really worried about rates. Uh, I was in the speed in which they rise. If, if, if rates took a slow path to 3%, 3.5%, we could handle it. It's when it happens overnight. Boom. What's going on? I mean, all of you have to be a little bit, what's going on? I mean, the news, and they don't help. The market was down 2%. They're like, the market's crashing. I went, we're down 2%, 2 cents of every dollar. Do you know the market today is where it was December 17th of last year? You've lost two months unless you put all your money in the market for the first time in the last 30 days. You gave up 60 days and were freaking out. 
oh my God. Well, I guess so. We haven't had a 5% correction in 66 weeks. That's unusual. You usually get three 5% corrections a year. And it's been, so we forgot. <laughs> oh, market can go down. What the heck is going on? It's normal. Since when do utilities trade at 25 times earnings? But in this cycle, very overweight, overrated or overvalued. So yeah, I think rates will trend higher, but, but they won't go as high as people think simply because of the global demand that's out there. But the new issuance certainly puts some up, upward pressure. Here's what's driving everybody crazy. Why is the dollar going down when interest rates are rising? If our rates are rising faster than the rest of the world, our dollar would usually would be going up. And that's because the dollar is more correlated to Trump's approval rating than anything I can find. <laughs> Big surprise. 86% correlation right now. Oh. I mean, you hear, if you watch those news programs, they've been, well, the dollar, and, and they can't find a reason. It used to be the difference between the two-year U.S. generic uh, sovereign and the euro, and then it was the 10-year, because I follow all that stuff. And then I ran across this. I went, oh, my goodness. It's falling. It'll delink at some point. It'll go, okay, I'm tired of that. Let's get back to business and look at the interest rate spreads. But that's what's been impacting the dollar. And it is kind of in a downtrend right now. That could change. A lot of people think the repatriation of money will strengthen the dollar. It's already in dollars. Six companies control two-thirds of all the money that's outside offshore. Six companies. Two-thirds. And it's already in dollars. So I'm not really buying that, that argument. It, it, the, the dollar should... The dollar should eventually strengthen uh, as our growth relative to the rest of the world is faster, but right now it's not. We had a great stock market last year. Between Europe, Japan, and emerging markets, we came in last. We came in fourth of the four, as good as that market is. Earnings drive stock prices over time. We all learned that in school and earnings. This is interesting. So this is the earnings, this is the year over year earnings. And everybody keeps saying, well, we're so long and then late cycle. We had negative earnings growth in 2016. We had four quarters of it. It was an earnings recession. They were just getting started. I doubt it's only going to last four or five quarters. Since the tax reform, earnings have gone up from 146 to 157, that's, that's about eight times higher than we normally see. Earnings are first quarter will be up 17%, and they'll be up in the second quarter. Analysts are revising their earnings upward almost monthly. Now, I follow something called the earnings revision ratio, how many managers are right, raising uh, earnings estimates and how many are downgrading and you take the ratio and it just gives you a really good, when it's over one, stock markets go higher. It's over three right now. And it's been hovering around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1.1, .1, and then the tax proposal that front loaded and gave corporations a tax cut and boy, they're just, that's what's so interesting about this correction. I mean, if this is a bear market, this is the first time we've seen a bear market with rising earnings. Because normally you don't have major corrections when earnings are growing. You just don't. And earnings are growing right now. And, and not maybe, they are. In fact, it's really hard for analysts to calculate the currency conversion because of the extra business we'll do overseas because not only of greater growth, but the pricing advantage from the weak dollar. But yes, earnings are likely to surprise on the upside, not the downside. And it's not just earnings, it's revenue growth. We're finally seeing top line growth for the first time. It's not just the company buying back shares of, of stock, which I thought was a way of financially manipulating the balance sheet until I had dinner with actually some of the Merrill Lynch uh, clients. And <clears throat> this gentleman came up to me. Maybe he's here in the audience because he was very nice about spanking me a little bit. He goes, you know, you said something about financial manipulation. <clears throat> I, uh, I run a fairly successful waste management company. We have about $750 million in free cash flow. Uh, we're either going to buy a waste disposal company or we're going to buy a waste disposal company. <laughs> Which meant his own shares. 
if I can't find a company that has a higher return on an investment than what we have, then I'll just buy more shares of our own stock. He goes, should I put it in money markets at 0.1? No, sir. <laughs> Okay, maybe it's not financial manipulation. Maybe it's just smart business. But for a long time, that's what a lot of companies were doing. But now they're starting to invest. Because most companies aren't being rewarded for share buybacks. We follow that. Are they getting the kick in their stock price by buying back shares? No, they're getting, a, they're getting rewarded from, for investing their money. And that, to me, is good long term. So earnings are rising. How about valuations? Well, valuations are high. And I know people try to, well, they're not, no, they're high. They're just not extreme. But they're high. And when stocks are priced to perfection, when you have some uncertainty, you're going to get those knee-jerk reactions. And that's what we're having. That's all it is. It's something that's necessary but painful. Merrill Lynch uh, and uh, our firm, we had a buy signal last week on Thursday, end of the day. Um, this signal has been 11 for 11, uh, average decline in the market, average is 12.1%. Here I am as a portfolio manager, I'm like, oh, well, boy, okay, so who wants to, 11%, it's already down, half that, four. So then you wait for the next day to do something, and then you see that it's just a, 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 a drop, like a rock. So do you play into that emotion? Is that, is that smart investing? Because it could have gone up the following day just as easy as it went down. And then all of a sudden you find yourself becoming a trader instead of an investor. And I just haven't seen too many successful traders. You know, let's get back to basics. Why do you invest? What is important to you? The fundamentals are usually important. They're becoming more important. You have rising earnings. Yes, you have high valuations because we had low interest rates. Now, with higher rates, you've got to reprice the market. That's all. I mean, that's what it's doing right now, in my opinion. The question is, where do you invest? I Hopefully, you remember this chart from a couple years ago because it would have made you a lot of money. A lot of money. Since 1979, asset class outperformance has moved clockwise 80% of the time. When large value is best performing asset class, large growth is the next best performer, and then goes small growth, it goes small value. It worked 90% of the time until 08, you could have been on autopilot. But after 08, with quantitative easing, with liquidity disrupting the business cycle, it's been all over the board. But there's been a pattern of underperformance as well. Whatever quadrant's the best, the diagonal's the worst. That's worked 100% of the time since 09. Last year, large growth was the best performing asset class, small value was the worst performer, and the difference in return was 22%, 2,200 basis points. Now imagine if you had a model that allowed you to predict the best performer 80% of the time and the worst performer 100% of the time. Would you maybe put more money in the install box and less money in the, in the loser and own all four? That's what I do. Beats the S&P 83% of the time. So if the dollar is weakening and that benefits multinationals, what asset class has the highest percentage of multinationals? Large cap growth. Huh. I keep hearing about, well, you ought to buy, I heard this the other day, well, from the Federated Strategist, which is a value shop. So what did he like? We like small cap value and, and large cap value, because there's been a big interest rate difference, uh, a, big, a big return differential. Yeah, D do any of you remember the late 90s? Every time you took money out of large growth, it was dead money. You put it in large value, small value, it didn't do anything. There was no sell signal to get out of large growth, and there's no sell signal to get out of large growth now. Large, value ha large growth has the highest percentage of multinationals, has a number of tech companies that have actually real earnings growth. In fact, the tech sector is the number one sector for earnings growth for the next five years. Financials, number two. Healthcare, number three. The reason that small cap value, is, is, to me, is a problem is it's only been this expensive two times in history. It's already priced in the tax cuts that they'll benefit from. They're highly levered, which means they get, they're negatively affected by a rise in rates. And they are negatively affected by volatility. And that we're getting right now. 
And value is just a function of financials and energy, which have done pretty well. But there's other sectors in there that have really weighed that down. This isn't a value market. This is, I, I want growth and earnings to justify the multiple. So don't be surprised if you see another year where large growth is the best and small value is the worst. That would be consistent with mature stages of a bull market. See, here's the problem that's difficult for a lot of us who have been doing this for years. In the mature stages of a bull market, fundamentals and valuations take a backseat to sentiment and something known as technical analysis. The study of how markets move. This market's being traded almost to perfection. We'll see what happens today, because we're coming up against the 100-day moving average. If we break that, then you're looking at the 200-day moving average, which is about 2,600, a little bit, 2,611. It'll change every day. So yes, I, I, uh, for a stock market that I believe is in the seventh, bottom of the seventh, uh, I still think we have some more upside because of this earnings growth. Uh, thanks for the tax cuts, tax reform. It'll add a year or two to the bull market. But the fact of the matter is, there's other countries that are in earlier stages of their bull market. Europe, fifth inning, sixth inning. Japan, third inning. Emerging markets, second inning. Um, what can I say? Europe is uh, a replay of the U.S. I said this a couple years ago. If you weren't here, I'll share it again. Europe is a replay of the U.S. just in German subtitles. It's the same movie. <laughs> They're copying our playbook. Inject liquidity and keep injecting it until the economy grows. And they're growing. They're growing faster than us. The region is, and Greece is actually profitable. Now they got a surplus. That's what happens when you say, I'm not going to pay 80% of my debt. You say, okay. <laughs> That's how that game, that was a really interesting game, right? I'm not going to pay it. Don't tell anybody. We'll just go through the motions, right? But Europe is a replay of the U.S., and their companies are starting to get smarter. And the problem is their currency is strong, so they're going to have a hard time generating additional sales. Japan is the big, to me, the, the big secret right now. Because everybody goes, oh, they have a lot of old people. We're not buying people, we're buying companies. <laughs> it's the only major market still trading below its long-term average in valuations. Only major market still trading 40% uh, below its all-time high. It's got the, it did have the number one uh, earnings upward revisions and the strongest earnings growth because of President Abe and what he's doing. He's, institu he's, making, he's instituting reforms that we've never seen before. So Japanese electronic companies, those, those are akin to our defense companies because if he's able to change the constitution and invest money in military, the electronic companies will benefit. They're the world's leader in robotics, Japan is. China will benefit the most from uh, artificial intelligence which I guess is what, stealing information from? Well, but but they, will, they will gain 1.6% a year in GDP growth just from AI. And they've got such a burgeoning uh, middle class, and the reality is we're not their number one market. We're not even their number two market export. So yeah, the rest of the world it just is in a different position. US, you can see, is now 24% uh, of the world's GDP, so if you have less than 50% of your uh, investments overseas, you're underweight. But I understand that. Very few people do have a bigger position of their home country. But it does look like the U.S. outperformance is changing. We're now seeing the overseas markets outperform the U.S. consistently, and that's because their earnings are growing faster and their valuations were less, and they're becoming more self-sufficient. So here's maybe the part that you're wondering about. Let's talk about the markets, can we? or not. <laughs> so you see different covers, color, uh, covers here. Uh, you see light blue and uh, dark blue. Uh, dark blue is the bull market. So they last 16 to 20 years. These are called secular bulls, secular bears. I uh, met my new neighbor in Annapolis, and he says, I've got all my money at Vanguard. I go, really? Why is that? And he goes, because active managers can't outperform. I go, well, how often does Vanguard outperform their benchmark? He goes, what do you mean? I go, what percentage of the time do they outperform their benchmark? I'll answer the question. The answer is never. They never beat their benchmark. The reality of it is between active and passive, I've studied it for the last decade, is cyclical. It lasts six to eight years. And the trigger is interest rates. When rates rise, active managers typically beat passive investing. My problem with buying, holding, and forgetting a benchmark or an ETF is 
15, 20 years when the market trades sideways. 15, 20 years, market trades sideways. If you bought $100,000 in an uh, ETF, a market ETF in 1997, 12 years later, it was worth 100,000. You made nothing but dividends. If you bought another 198 and waited 11 years, it was still worth 100. And in 99, 12 years, and in 2013 years. So imagine if you said, well, I'm gonna buy this, I'm gonna invest in the market, I'm gonna retire in 12 years. Ooh, same amount I started with. That's not acceptable to me. There's smarter ways, more intelligent ways to invest. You can actively manage an ETF portfolio. I'm doing it myself right now just to use that low-cost provider, but do it more intelligently. But my problem is you buy the market, the later stages of a bull market, you have a high probability 10, 15 years from now looking at the same amount unless you actively manage it or use an active manager. And don't be afraid to pay for skill as long as they deserve to be paid. Uh, um, get paid for skill. So here you should know, big market drawdowns, 25% or greater, tend to coincide with recessions 73% of the time. So this to me is not, we're not even near a recession. All the recession indicators are less than 10% odds of going into recession in the next 12 months. And I'll show you that next slide. But the fact is, you can see that Average decline, 44%. Average time frame, 14.6 months. Average time to recover, long time. So these are bear markets. So if we're not in a bear market, what are we in? So here's the recession model, seven for seven, low risk. It's, it's been accurate 100% of the time. So the odds of, of a recession are very low. But here, how about a correction? What do we know about corrections? We know they last on average, 60 days, market declines 9.1%. How long does it take to recover? 55 days until you've made up all the losses. It's now the time to sell? Yes, if earnings were falling. Or if we had companies that had no earnings and you were just buying a dream. But these earnings are real and they're accelerating. So yes, to me, this is a correction that's painful. Maybe you wait and, and pay more knowing that it's over with. I'm not sure it is over this second. It tends to last 60 days. I just know we've got some earnings behind it to drive these markets higher. And I know that all you've lost is 60 days of returns because that's where the market was 60 days ago. So maybe it does drop another 3 or 4%. All it's doing is repricing to me, to something that is exaggerated, the inflation risk and interest rate risk. I just don't see it the way the market's responding. Here's my concern. This, I was shocked. The S&P 500, the last 20 years, has averaged 7.86%, but the average retail investor has averaged 2.11. Why is that? It's either your broker, <laughs> your advisor, but it's not, that's not it. Is it the fees? If fees are 1%, just add, add 3.1, you're still not close to 7.86. And we know what it is. They, they buy at the wrong time, they sell at the wrong time. Here's what I want to show you. This number here is telling me that Retail. So we're in the second best bull market in history, and in 2014, 15, and 16, retail investors were selling their stock positions. They weren't adding in the second best bull market. They were selling during the second best bull market. And it seems like every single time we get a little hitch in the market, oh, here's another 08 again. No, those only happen usually once in a lifetime, something that significant. So they were selling until when? Last month. Last month they bought $25 billion and they bought $100 billion in the last 90 days. I should have known. I should have just went, oh, this market's going to correct. Absolutely. They got in at the top, what may be a temporary top. How many of them are probably selling right now? Whoop, we're going through a wait. I missed it again. I'm never doing this again. I'm going to buy a bond and lose money there as interest rates rise. 
It's scary. It's a frightening thing for me because money's important. Are you making high probability decisions? 91% of your, asset, your successful success in investing isn't stock picking or market timing. It's the way you allocate your portfolio. That's all. 91% success has to do with where you put your assets. Do they all move the same? Or do you have a diversified portfolio that evens out these corrections that we're going through right now? And there's ways to build it, but I see buying, owning a lot of different things is not diversification. So, no, I don't think we're at the end of the bull market. I think we have another up phase. I think we have another year. Interest rates is, you can see, <laughs> this was done two months ago, a month and a half ago. Biggest risk, rising interest rates. Well, we're seeing that now. And that's because of the indebtedness in the marketplace. It is still a risk. If the tenure goes to three, three and a half, or four, then, then we probably are done. I just don't think they go that high that, that quick, that soon. I will be more than happy to stay here as long as anybody wants to ask personal questions. I'll take a few questions uh, right now if we have time. And then I wish you uh, much success and safe travels. Yes, sir. You mentioned something about there's basically six, com six companies that are Two-thirds of all the cash that's offshore. What are they? Healthcare companies and tech companies. I do know. Um, Pfizer was one of them. Uh, I'm not going to be able to name all six because I've somehow seem to be forgetting right now. But it's, um, it's Apple, it's Microsoft, um, Pfizer, and another couple of uh, healthcare companies I can't think of off the top of my head. But yeah, it's most of it. So it's not as, it's, it's not the impact a lot of people think. So healthcare and tech. That is correct. So that's why I like healthcare and tech, because they'll bring their money back here and use it to enhance their stock price in some way. The other thing that reason I'm not concerned about this correction is it's not as if investors said, oh, I'm really worried about growth, so I'm going to go defensive. Or I'm really worried about large cap growth, I'm going large value, or large versus small, or U.S. Everything is falling. I can tell you yesterday looked like some type of computer program that just hit the switch. It was automatic because of the type of downturn. Everything was red on my screen. Every country in the world, every asset class, stock, bond, gold, there was no safe haven. So I'm thinking, okay, so there's this money in cash. Where does it go? At some point, it's, gotta, it's not going to sit there and cash it 1%. Is it going into real estate? Probably not. Commodities, maybe. Bonds in a rising interest rate environment, that's, that doesn't work. It's probably coming back to the equity market. That's why I think we have another leg. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, we have several Vistage members in here, and we follow Bolio Brothers for the last 20 uh, years. I don't know if you know them, ITR, but they're coming out with a depression in uh, 2029, 2030, a depression, not a recession. Just want to get your thoughts on long-term uh, vision. Um, usually the people that talk about those things have missed this bull market the last five years, and I keep talking about it and talking about it and talking about it, and one of these days they'll be right. And they're on TV right now saying, oh, I told you so. Well, yeah, but you missed the, the last 100% move. Um, but when I think about a, a 23, 20, I think the... One, the economy is more diversified. We're a global economy, so they don't have to, we don't have to rely upon just the U.S. Um, but I do worry about the debt levels. Uh, I hope these earnings that corporations are making, they'll use to pay down their debt level um, because it is extreme. But it's still manageable because most companies have locked in their debt at very low levels. Most consumers, uh, they're more, they're, they have plenty of money to pay their mortgage. So I don't see the uh, imbalances that we had in 08 or 2002. Um, to me, this will be fairly quick. We'll head down and then we'll get a sense of, okay, where the market, uh, how stocks should be priced based on what the Fed's going to do, and then it'll start to grind higher as earnings continue to surprise on the upside. I don't see it. Yes, sir. I know that a couple of years ago that you weren't that concerned about either the inflation rate or the debt no, that's I wasn't. looming in the economy. 
Has your opinion on that changed at all? And at no. what point do those two elements become critical <sighs> as far as an investor is concerned? So thanks for remembering what I said two years ago. That was, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I applaud you for that. that was, that's, that's impressive. Even I had, for, no, I didn't forget that. Um, I wasn't concerned about rates or inflation two years ago. Uh, I'm still not as concerned about inflation. I'm concerned about rates because of this, the, new, the amount of new issuance. So I've got all this supply coming on that's got to compete for a rate at a time when central banks are starting to tighten, when uh, consumers, corporations, and the government have debt levels uh, that, that usually restrict growth. So Trump's tax plan that's supposed to be uh, so um, growth driven, uh, that works when total debt to GDP is under 225%, but when you get over 225, the amount adding more debt, you don't get the same bump, you don't get the same velocity, you don't get the same growth impact, and we're at 240%. We're at an all-time high, total debt to GDP, all-time high today. So I am concerned because we're more interest rate sensitive than we've ever been. So the undoing of this bull market will be credit. So I looked at the bond market, I looked at high yields, but there's another way to measure risk and look at something called credit default swaps. How many people are buying insurance on the credit in the high yield market? To see that, That's one way to see if the pain, and I'm not seeing it. Oh yeah, they've, the prices have gone up, it's costing more to get insurance, but it's just where it was last November. So it's not pricing in this big meltdown. It's not at all. And that's another thing that tells me that, okay, I've got some kind of computer trading going on. It's, it has to do with trading something called volatility VIX. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, have programs that will use the VIX with their aggressive stock positions, they use, and it's not working right now. And so they're getting, rolling out of those, those positions right now at a time when there's no bids. But yes, I am more concerned. Yes. You spoke about uh, major companies investing in robotics. Can you speak just for a minute to um, the concern, the speed with which robotics and technology is replacing the middle class jobs and the speed with which and the timing it takes to replace those and retrain people into the marketplace and what potential consequence that has from a market perspective? Oh, boy. Um, I, I can't talk about the speed. Um, it, it's kind of relative, it, but it is replacing jobs, and it means the disparity in income is going to continue to grow. Um, we have a lot of jobs available. We just don't have the people trained for those jobs, and by restricting immigration, we will continue to lose that battle to other countries more and more. And you're seeing it already. Uh, we gave China a windfall by not going into TPP. Uh, that made us look like the bad guys, and China says, hey, I'll be, I'll be partners with you in business. And uh, so now we're getting crowded out of some of these markets in, in a very popular way. So that, that, and now we got NAFTA up. That'll cost us a million jobs if we leave NAFTA. A million jobs in the U.S. We'll lose, plus we'll lose GDP growth. And if you look at the numbers close enough. So robotics uh, will increase productivity, will increase corporate profitability. Uh, but it won't, uh, it won't improve the standard of living for a lot of people in this country. That's just not going to happen. Nothing's going to happen in that area unless we become more educated in the sciences, in the STEM programs, right? In my opinion. Because uh, that's where it's going. If you want to look at mega trends in the future, one is uh, video, um, uh, online education, and tutorial. Uh, Asians spend 14% of their income on education, and it's growing 25 to 40% a year. The, the population that's entering into college, they have to get, be tested, and so their parents pay a lot of money for them to learn online to get that extra education. The other uh, uh, area is transportation, both cars, uh, but mostly airports and planes. You know, India, as big as they are, they only have 400 planes, and it takes six years to get a plane. Um, and so that aviation and Boeing, companies like that around the world, uh, more slim bodied, uh, more fuel efficient, uh, that's a mega trend that will go on for a couple of decades. The way we buy cars is changing, as you know, whether we go electric or driverless or whether we even decide to own a car. And there's going to be a lot of companies that fill that space 
and um, putting person uh, in some vehicle to get you from point A to point B. And so that, that to me is a mega trend. Cell technology, battery cell technology. And certainly online shopping is, is, is revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing the way we're doing business. And there's still more business and I think money to be made there as well. So there's four areas that if you just want to look at trends, mega trends, uh, I would look for the companies that are in that space. And um, who knows about cryptocurrency, but I think we've all learned an interesting lesson now with Bitcoin under $7,500 and Maybe you read last week, coin currency, which is a cryptocurrency in Japan, got hacked and uh, $575 million was stolen. Oops. <laughs> so uh, that was like the tulip bubble, right? Kind of. But there's something to be said for cryptocurrencies just because of the way it... Good morning, Richard. Thank you. Know, you. Excellent presentation. Hope uh, so. We never talk about geopolitical risk anymore. Uh, this market seems immune to it. Are we correct or should we be paying more attention to that? Uh, should we be paying more attention to geopolitical risk? Um, well, if, it's, if the dollar is following that, then the answer is yes. Uh, and there's a way for us to do that now. There's a way for, I, 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 so there are two professors from Stanford and one from the University of Chicago. You can have this downloaded every month. It's called the Policy Uncertainty Index. And it will tell you whether it's high or low, whether the market's pricing in that fear, that uncertainty, or too complacent. And it's a great way of measuring what I call exogenous shocks. I used to never follow politics as an impact on the market. Now you have to follow it because it has an impact. It has an impact in Europe. It's put UK in a recession. That was the craziest thing in the world. Oh, we're going to lo lose, leave the euro. R why? That's two-thirds of your business. Who did that? Oh, the retirees who have a lifetime income now, not the workers. They didn't vote. Oops. So now I think we're finding that out, that we, now it's more important for us to vote to get the things that we think we need for our lives. But yeah, politics is more important. Thank you so much. I hope I uh, gave you something you can work with. I appreciate it.